we're, we're going to start um, by talking about procrastination. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, that's something that we feel is an under-discussed aspect of the writing life. Although, certainly, uh, Henry Foster Wallace talked a lot about it. Yeah, but um, so uh, I'm going to kind of hand it over to Richard, and so, we're going to we're going to have a conversation. But I I, uh, I want him to kind of say a few things about uh, procrastination. Well, yeah, I mean, just it's procrastination and engagement. Finally, finally engaging in the work over a course of a day, and you know we're married, we live together. Um, we're kind of like hot for each other, and we're both writers, um, which could be the I remember when I was like 22, I lived for two months with a writer, and the deal was I would kill all the roaches in her apartment, and then she, she would type um, my short story for class. And it's, it's improved, you know, with looking considerably. Um, I didn't know that. Part of that yeah, story. I, just thought about I know that. she gave you horrible asthma because she had cats, but you yeah, didn't know you had asthma. Yeah, she had a water bed. And live yeah, and she and was not a good writer, and you were constantly like, she was jealous. It was kind of like Jonathan Franzen, and uh, I forget who that writer was. See, we don't know who she is. Oh, but Dave, she wrote David a, Henry Foster Wallace, right? No, no, no. It's a Jonathan Franzen. And she wrote an essay. I feel like it was in. Uh, being with a more successful. Yeah, I forget where it was. Was it in Granta or something like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. So that's what Richard's first writer writer relationship was like. Like she was a poet and it was like Well, I was all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean I always felt like I, what I learned there was never live with a, another writer because <laughs> you're always at different stages in your careers, you always one person's productive, the other person's not, and it, it creates an un uncomfortable, um, it could create a very high anxiety, negative thing. But I also felt like I had to live with somebody um, in the arts because to be a writer or, or, or a sculptor or a dancer or an actor, at least you understand you live in a certain world which is not the, the workaday world of you know punching a clock and drawing a salary. It's like you have different priorities. And even if you're not in the same medium, you both belong to that kind of world, so that was okay. Um, and then when I met Lorraine, um, she's a novelist. Uh, I loved her book before I met her. <coughs> She had read my books, and for about two seconds, I felt like, uh-oh, you're going to wind up living with another uh, writer. Then on the third second, I said, so what? <laughs> and we've been together for eight years. Um, but the thing in the morning, I think what's underreported to writers, <laughs> and when writers feel bad about themselves because they can't quite get to work that day, for an unconscionable amount of time, that is called normal. <laughs> Nobody wants to work, or you know, listen, uh, there, there are very lucky few who are very disciplined and they get to work and it's very unconflicted. But most of the writers I know, um, like Lorraine and myself, it's a battle to get to the desk. And the battle can last two thirds of the day. And um, it could be a number of things. Like, it, it could be you know the anxiety of getting to the work. It could be um, I, I am not worthy of what I'm trying to write. Who's kidding who? It could be um, lazy, or I don't feel like working today, or it could be anything. But we have gotten into the habit of like forgiving each other for not doing jack shit for about four hours. Well, we, we actually have a word that we call this. Yeah. We, we call it fiducering uh, when we're not writing, but we should be. And usually fiducering is done in front of the computer. But of course, you're not writing. You're fiducering. 
you're looking up, you know, uh, how, why swallowtails are called swallowtails. You're looking up, uh, you know, oh my God, I really need more pantyhose. Or, oh, you know, he's always on eBay buying like weird shit to do with the book I'm working on. Like, what's that about? I don't know why he does that, but he does. Like when I was writing about um, Pakistan, he was like going onto eBay and finding little Pakistan trinkets for me. And I was like, why? And I think it's because he didn't want to write that day. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, it, it's, but if we start today, it's like, you have a ritual. It's like, okay, first of all, um, hmm, I think I'm going to make too much coffee. I'm, I'm going to pop uh, five milligrams of Addy just for, you know. Addy? Adderall, sorry. Yeah, you need to translate um, for it. There's other human And that'll give me enough me. energy to read the paper. <laughs> um, and it's just like one thing after another. So we're both sitting there reading a the paper, and this combination of like just pleasure combined with this haunting voice in the back of your head saying, look at you, look at you, you know. <laughs> and um, so like fiducia, it, it's, it's a part of getting yourself together, uh, and that's good, and it's pleasurable, and that's good, but this feeling of like you're screwing off personally, um, it's like there's something wrong with me because I'm enjoying myself. Um, I should be writing. I should be writing every day and every minute. And uh, so we'll do, you know, and you know, Lorraine can tell you about her own brain casing, but... Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I need it. I, I can't. I need it. And it's like I finally am getting to the point where I feel like, you know what? You're not a bad person because you're not working. You know, it's like this is what you do. Later you'll work. Just accept it. Just forgive yourself. And but 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 I think, yeah, I can't. Well, so. well, I think, you know, first of all, we are working on very different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and when we first got together, Richard was writing a lot of screenplays. Um, and I was finishing my second novel. And when you're working on, uh, you know, television pilots or screenplays, you are just typing away all day. You're like, I could hear him because we, our offices are right on the same floor. They're actually in the same room. And uh, I could hear him typing like, like, bana like crazy. Or not. No, no, you typed a lot. And I, Everything. you know, a novel is a much different beast. You know, it's, it's really about uh, getting in the zone or inspiration. And I was at the end of that novel, and I was having a lot of doubts about that novel. And uh, he, meanwhile, he's like, and that was really, like, hard on me. But, but I think I fiducered less then. Um, I think my fiducery hit like an all-time high when I started working on my third novel, which I wrote three drafts of and then ultimately had to put aside. So when you are unsure about a novel to that extent, any distraction you can find, you will find it and you will go for it, you know. But he's always writing screenplays in addition to the novel, so I feel like he's always working. You know, that's my... See, but the, the other one always thinks the other one has it easy because... <laughs> You know, I just feel like I'm just doing this, like, screenplay work or pilots that'll never get produced, so who cares? Lorraine's doing something worthy. You know, <laughs> she's writing a novel. I'm just... So it's it's always feels like a trade-off. But I guess what I wanted to go from, at some point, the procrastination... I think people procrastinate until the panic monster shows up. And sometimes what drives me to work is this feeling of like um, pa sheer panic. Like, you have not worked yet today. It's not like, ah, oh, I feel like writing. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I feel like there's a, 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 an electric cattle prod, you know, of, of, of anxiety that just gets me up there. Then the experience kind of becomes one of immersion. Because this thing that I've been avoiding for six hours in order to do for four hours, um, once I'm in it, I'm in it. It's just like, what was, what what was, was that all about? It's that. like, yeah. you know, it's like standing on the edge of a pool for um, four hours 
avoiding jumping in, then you jump in, the water's fine. Or not. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's like if you don't like the jog, you can spend three hours buying new shoelaces or, you know, wondering if you have fallen arches or something like that. And then you jog for 30 minutes. It's like just, you, I wish human beings were, were more um, efficient and more <laughs> logical, but we're not. And the last thing I want to say about procrastination is that people should hope. I know there's writers here that lambaste themselves all the time for not getting to it on a daily basis. Or And um, just be kind to yourself. I mean, you're, you're not writing because you don't want to write today. If you wanted to write, and you'd probably be writing. but. Being a good person doesn't mean um, being a productive writer. You know, it's just it's terrible because any other job you have out, you know, you have your hours, you have your tasks. But sometimes the worst thing is to be free of all that because then you become your own boss, and you can lay in bed for three weeks and nobody will notice. You know, so <laughs> it's all a trade-off. But the engagement process is really different. It's, I experience writing, once I'm into it, it's, it's sort of like levitation. And maybe this is part of the resistance to, um, uh, it's almost like you have to go, come out of your body into, into the body of a character that doesn't exist except in your head. And it really feels like, you know, transmigration of, uh, I don't want to say souls, but it's tough. You're lifting yourself out of your physical core you know, into this world of imagination. And it's, but once you're there, and I noticed this with Lorraine too, once you're there, you're gone. You are really there. And that's the, it's like, you go from like total diffusion to utter focus. And- um, Well, sometimes you do. I mean, you know, when I was working on that Pakistan novel that, that had three drafts and never saw the light of day, um, you know, I, I, one of my biggest problems was I couldn't get lost in it. I couldn't uh, feel that that feeling of like it's it's kind of pulling me. Instead of I felt like every word I wrote down was like this huge effort, and every sentence and every paragraph and every I mean, it just was it was just nightmares. Right now I'm working on a nonfiction book, and that book, uh, first of all, I had to do immersion reporting for several years, and then I. I uh, actually spent a year uh, doing active reporting, not just observing and witnessing, but actually uh, scheduling interviews and going to archives and, and looking at records. And now I've begun writing that book. And that book, because I'm so excited about it, it, I do become lost. Once I go into my office, I'm actually the person with the fingers going now. And that is such a relief to me. Because and I'm I in the was, outer office going, just listening to her. I, yeah, and I was like, maybe I've lost it. Maybe I only had two books in me, and that's it. You know, like it's over. Um, uh, I mean, because that's one of the things, especially. You know, I came to writing novels late. I my first novel was published when I was forty three. I was a journalist for twenty years before that. So you know, I always felt like my my purchase on the writer's life was kind of not so so strong and. Uh, and I think my second novel I felt very insecure about. Um, so I've been, I've been really going through some horrific anxiety about just my viability as, as, as a published, you know, creative author. And, you know, Richard, his first novel was published when he was 24 years old. Um, you know, he just kind of banged it out. He, he told me he started it because uh, he went to visit a girl uh, over Thanksgiving that he was dating and at Cornell. And basically, she left him with his mother to go date with another mother. guy. With her mother. Yeah. She left Richard with her mother. And Thanksgiving said, hi, I'm going on a date with uh, Matthew over here. And made Richard so like angry. Well, she, she said, actually, it was more like, um, yeah, I'm just going to visit a friend for a few hours. Oh, wow. We knew what that that's meant. What, and, and that's when he started writing The Wanderers. 
he literally sat down at that girl's house and started writing the Wanderers at, in a fit of like, you will not destroy me. Um, so, you know, for him, writing has been of much longer duration. He's written eight novels. And uh, it, it's, it's a whole different world for him. And he's, he's famous. I mean, I remember when we first started seeing each other, we went to the Edinburgh Book Festival. And there were lines of people to see him. I was like, wow. I mean, well, it was in just. In all fairness, <laughs> it was me and David Simon from The Wire. So. No, David uh -huh. wasn't there. Uh -huh. He was? No. Oh, never mind, never mind. I have to tell you one other thing about my husband. He is adorably self-deprecating and like, he, oh, David Simon was there. I wasn't there. No one would lie, be in a wait for me, but they were. They really were. So, uh, you See, know. But the thing is, no matter how much you write, I think there's an actual syndrome that has a name, which basically is this one is going to show people uh, the imposter that I am and have been <laughs> all along. You never get over that. <laughs> if you're writing your, your third book and your fear is, well, two books don't mean anything. This one is going to really show people how bankrupt you know, I am you know, as a creative being. But <laughs> I go through this with every, every book. And that and really helped me because here he was writing The Whites. And I, that was the first time I saw him write a novel you know, before my very eyes. Um, he thought it sucked all the time. I, I can't write anymore. I, I really, I can't. I, well, it's it's over. so sucky, and I just, I, 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 I don't. I, I mean, he was literally like a whining child the whole way through. But, he didn't but start with to a think masculine whine until until it was actually like Damn, getting baby. good reviews. Then he was like, "Well, I guess Mashiko Takatani likes it." I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> But, it, you know, it's, I think every time you start a book or a writing project, and I've seen this with Lorraine, and I know this in myself, it's like you've totally forgot how to do it, yeah. no matter how many times you did it before. And you just feel like you're running on a broken leg. Yeah. Um, and why don't I just stop running? You know, so it's, it's this combination of... Um, confidence and sheer panic that you're a fraud. Um, when she saw me working on the whites, I was, I was going around pulling my hair. I was covering the house with like multicolored index cards. This happens and that. But you know, it's not writing. It's, it's putting index cards out. You know that doctoral quote, note taking isn't writing, field work isn't writing, outlining isn't writing, writing is writing. So you get caught up in this frantic of uh, faux writing, you know, <laughs> my list had lists. And um, so she saw me, and then when my daughter came over to the house, my daughter at this point is 28, and um, I've known my daughter all her life, <laughs> and she's known me all my life. And no, Lorraine says, actually, God. she hasn't, but that's okay. Well, um, and Lorraine said to her, um, my God, you should see your father when he writes a book. He, he does this and he says that. And I'll go, and I'm saying, to Jen, it's never been this bad. I don't understand. <laughs> Jen says, I remember you when I was four years old and you were screaming, writing index cards. And pull, <laughs> you know, it's, it was so comforting to know I'm like this all the time. <laughs> you know, this is not, I mean, try to sort of uh, puncture the grandiosity of, you know, how, how bad I am. Um, no, no. He was convinced this was the book that was going to be the one me, yeah. that would make him unable to ever write novels. It would be over, over. And when Jen reminded him that, no, actually he felt about that, the novel you were writing when I was four years old, he was shocked. Really? But relieved. But, but relieved. Yeah, but relieved. It's sick. But it has helped me because I see that, you know, this is not whatever doubts I'm having are, are really normal, and that makes me feel great. Um, I mean, getting, getting back to the subject of living with a person who's pretty much doing what you're doing, um, you get very sensitive to their happiness around the project that they're working on. Yeah. And um, 
very attuned. We talk a lot. So we talk in the morning. Um, basically, um, boy, that coffee was good. Oh, did you read this in the Daily News? You know, this, this um, woman had Siamese triplets, blah, blah, blah. And at some point, we go up there. And so you're listening kind of in an empathetic way to the noises of productivity that <laughs> are or, or might not be coming from, from the other one. You work in, um, in the evening when we'll open a bottle of wine, we'll light some candles and sit there and say, how'd your work go today? You know, it's like, <laughs> but I mean, it's like you, you have somebody, it's second nature to talk to them about what you did because they understand because they're doing a parallel thing. And every rite of passage in the creating of a book has been experienced by both of us. So there's kind of like a shorthand. The, the downside, and Lorraine can talk about this, is that when you use the other person as the first reader, um, or for validation, because they're the person like you trust the most, or you're closest to, does what you do, it puts the other person in a dangerous spot because there's a lot of power being a first reader. And you want to be helpful. You want to be honest. You don't want to say the wrong thing. You want to say the absolute right thing. You know, so the downside is a vulnerability to the other. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a trust. And uh, please don't kill me. Um, <laughs> but it's... I never thought it could be like this. It's li basically waking up, uh, living and working all day long in an area separated maybe by about 20, 20 feet from each other all day long, stopping, coming down, talking about it a little more until you know, more interesting things come up. It's a full life. You know, it's a partnership in a way, even though we're working on entirely different things. What, you, what say you to that? Um, well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a partnership because uh, Richard, like I said, he goes on to eBay and buys me things to do with my books. Otherwise uh, known as avoiding you know, my like, own work. Once I was trying to write about my family's history in Coldale, Pennsylvania, he was like buying me ashtrays from the miners' pub in you know Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, that he found on eBay for three dollars. I have all of these ashtrays from <laughs> from the coal mining regions of Pennsylvania. This is like how he rolls. It's very, it's very. I've never been with anyone who gets so deeply involved in what I'm doing. Ashtrays, yeah. And he lo and you know he would buy me little. Uh, can they have these things in in coal mines. They had actually canaries in the coal mine shop. Right. Well, they have these little canary cages. And he would buy those on eBay for me too. Um, and it was, he describes them as like talismans to help me and inspire me. Um, and right now I'm writing a book about a church in Harlem. And uh, the church is very old and it was founded by a guy who was Irish and uh, was uh, born in the famine, the Great Famine in Ireland. And so he's been buying me all of these Ireland famine books. I mean, every so often, you know, a book comes in and he's like, you've got to read this book about the famine. So it's very moving to me um, that he does that for me. And I think when it goes the other way, it's like uh, when he wrote The Night Of, the limited HBO series that came out this summer, um, first of all, it took him forever, and that project took forever. It was the most agonizing project I've ever witnessed in my life. It went on and on and on. And, uh, but while he was writing it, I, or even before he wrote it, I suggested that he make the characters Pakistani. <laughs> so the odd thing that happened was he did make them Pakistani, the Pakistani novel that I was working on and had been traveling to Pakistan for years researching never came out. And now all the Pakistani like guys in our neighborhood, like our pharmacist and everything, is like, how did you understand our people so well? And you know, <laughs> you Lorraine's know? going, oh yeah, he's really great. Yeah. <laughs> 
But you know, this is the thing. It's you know, like when you're with somebody, it's so and funny. you get and you're very close, and you you have a daily conversation about where you're at, where you're at. Um, I did this. What I need to know is that. But, but, um, I tend because she's Lorraine's a pretty good storyteller. I tend to. I always use this analogy. There was an old Abbott and Costello movie where there was a, a huckster on a sidewalk who had a fold-up traveling case, and he was trying to sell these magic hypnotizing balls. And Abbott and Costello were standing behind the volunteer that um, was saying, you're getting sleepy, you're getting <laughs> sleepy. And the guy says, ah, nuts. And then the cop goes, hey, you, you don't have a life. And the guy packs up, and he runs away. And Bud Abbott says, ah, come on, Lou, let's go. And Lou's like, <laughs> you know. So when I listened to Lorraine talking about Ireland, all of a sudden I'm obsessed with Ireland. <laughs> and part of it is to help her, but part of it is she hooked me. And I felt that way about Pakistan. <laughs> and writing about this church, I'm Jewish. I have been in more churches in the last eight years <laughs> Then I have my entire, I think I've, it, more than any number of synagogues I've been in my entire <laughs> life, you know, because I get hooked on what she's doing. So sometimes, you know, she said, I need to know more about this. And I'm saying, I don't want to work, um, but I want to do something. So I start researching what she <laughs> is looking for. It becomes part of his fiducering. Yeah. yeah, my thing. Then he's like, oh, I'll work on Lorraine's book instead. <laughs> no, but it's like every day. It's like, it's like bringing a dead mouse to the owner, you know, coming in and just dropping a book of Ireland at her feet. And we actually went to Ireland you know, for the book. And so we didn't go to any, you know, like equivalents of the Eiffel Tower and the White House. Um, and it was basically a trip for her book. But I was so into it. And it had nothing to do with anything I was doing. It's like you infect each other's imagination with what the other is doing. And um, well, I've never I, I had think, that. I think also, before I met Richard, I had read all of his work. And I was very in awe of him. And I had a best friend that was another writer and she also we whenever his books would come out we would buy them and talk about them and um and i think that we both are unusual in that we report our our works of writing yeah. like he re he when he wrote the night of he did a lot of research you know they call it research but we call it reporting and whenever i wrote harbor i it was research so was the room in the chair um, in a way, it would be like I was preparing for a nonfiction book, but instead I write a novel. In this case, I'm actually writing a nonfiction book. So, um, But I think because we have that similarity of temperament, I think that's also why we become involved in one another's projects. Also, we're drawn to stories of uh, you know, people who are misunderstood, people who are somehow trapped in some kind of uh, war setting or criminal justice setting. I think those things have made each of us very easily seduced by the other's project instead of sticking to our but, own. <laughs> but that's a good point, because um, since Clockers, I've learned, um, learned, I learned hanging out, um, partly because it's so much fun than actually sitting there, but hanging out with people you want to write about, like learning things, not just about what they do, but who they are. And Lorraine's been doing it as a reporter, you know. So when we met each other, all of a sudden I realized, wait a sec, we, we both do the exact same thing in fiction and in nonfiction, and sort of reinforced for each other, this is the way to do it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, I'm sitting there with Jane Austen and say, oh, I never left the village, you know, and I'm Jane Austen. What do you think about that, Robert Louis Stevenson? You know, it's... Um, <laughs> He, there's, there's a lot of... Jane Austen never knew Robert Louis No, Stevenson. that's not... I know, of He's course never not. read Jane Austen, and of course, I devoured Jane Austen as a young woman, so... I like, know they didn't know each other. I'm just saying, oh, this guy's I, been... To, <laughs> so one writer's been all okay. around the world, and he's written his stuff. Some, some young woman never leaves her village, and yeah. she writes her stuff. 
So uh, yeah, we're much better, you know, aligned. It, yeah. I mean, you know, good writing is good writing. It doesn't make a difference if somebody, you know, felt dependent on hanging out, or someone felt like. No, it's all intellectual. It's in my head. I know people, and I don't have to leave the house. It, you know, it, quality will out at the end. But there are tensions because Richard has also been working on a novel about Harlem. And yeah. when I started doing all this immersion reporting regarding this, this church in Harlem, he would be like, oh, wow, you're getting really good stuff. And, yeah. and I'd be like, oh, well, yeah, it is good, but, but you, what you'll do will be so much better. You know, and then, then he would find stuff, and I'd say, are you using that? Because I might use that. He's like, no, no, I'm using it. Oh, well, and, and then, like, he used stuff in the night of, and I was like, but that's from Harlem. He's like, well, I, I needed it, you know, so. You know, it's, like, it's like borrowing a cup of Johnny Walker black label. <laughs> No, there You've is. Got to be careful. Yeah, because we we live in Harlem. We're writing about Harlem, and we're we're you know. So we're both like, writing about Harlem, but yeah, you know, from different slants. Like um, there's this wonderful guy across the street. Well, I guess I should. Well, his name is Fantastic, and um, he lives in the building across the street from us. And he would sit out. He he sat outside, you know, the last year, and whenever a woman would go by, he'd go. Fantastic. And, uh, Sometimes so, these women were like 11 years old. And he did it to me, and I'm 57 years old. I and mean, she's it was, the only one that stopped to said, why, thank you. I was thrilled, you know. But but he was he offended people. And one, one father of one of these little girls went back to him and said, I will motherfucking fuck you up if you say one more thing to my daughter. And, of course, if Richard imitated it, he would do it better than me because I can't really do that imitation those, thing. Those words coming out of us. <laughs> An angel face like that. No, but anyway, like, so, so, so then we found out that he had just gotten out of prison and that he was actually dating a woman. He said, I let her take me to Applebee's. Yeah. But I got it sweet. She t yeah. But I'm not sure I'm going to let her take me there forever. And we were like, what an interesting concept. You know, like, that's fascinating. No, he wanted to go back to school. This guy oh. wanted to go back oh, to yeah. school, and he was trying to talk this woman into paying his tuition. Yeah, that's and, it. That's it. I forgot that part. And his, yeah. his threat to her is, if you don't pay my tuition, I ain't going to let you take me to Applebee's anymore. Yeah. He said, I'll do it with you, yeah. but no Applebee's. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have yeah. sex with you, but I, you can't buy my... So then, then you know, you know, months go by. He's always out there, you know, and he's a, a, a prison dude. So he's got the, the scaffolding is up, you know, scaffolding is all, and he's p doing the chin ups and everything, you know, because this is like part of the whole thing when you get out of prison. And then one day we hear, guess what? Fantastic got stabbed. Not only stabbed, but then the hilt snapped away from the knife by some pissed off. Husband, boyfriend, or father, yeah. and uh, fantastic wasn't doing so fantastic. <laughs> no, so not. we're looking at each other. We're going, it's like, like there's there's the story. <laughs> we both won it. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, you know. and I'm like, hey, he's a block from my, from the church. Yeah, yeah, but he's not religious. Yeah, so. and he didn't go to church, Lorraine. But, oh, yeah. but, but but he's part of the neighborhood. Oh. Well, everything's part of the neighborhood in that case. <laughs> Um, no, I might as well write about Tribeca, then you win. Um, no, it, it wasn't. I mean, it was. No, it was funny. It was funny. My favorite story about competing f for language or event uh, was that. But then there was the time I went. David Simon took me around Baltimore when I was about to start writing for the Wire, and he took me to visit some some junkie that he knew well. He was in the hospital recovering from his, he's had all kinds of like heroin, edema in his hands. And at one point, the guy, David says something and the guy says, well, ain't that the apple scrapple? And it's like we heard the word apple scrapple and we both looked at each other. <laughs> and it was like two gunmen. <laughs> apple scrapple, I got it. You know. But I gave it to him because it was his town. 
<laughs> but we, yeah, we, we'll, we'll go for a little. Um, uh, you're peeing in the corner of my forest, you yeah, know. I'm yeah, sorry, you mark yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, can we? Do we open? Yeah, we should open it up to questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll take questions, but if you like, uh, but just, you know, if you can get just short uh, questions yeah. that are actually questions. Yeah. Don't yeah. don't stand up and make a comment because it's not fair to other no, people. No, no. Yeah. Uh, how do I balance screenwriting and novel writing? Well, I need to do the screenwriting in order to buy myself the time to write novels. So I have to do it because I can't afford to write novels. I can't afford to sit there for three years, not making money. You know, who's you know? I mean, so it's a matter of necessity. Uh, I find. Writing television, it's it or you know screenplays, it's, it's kind of a novel light. You know, it's kind of like you don't you don't want to be hitting it every day, every day, every day. I just sometimes I want to keep writing, but I don't want to have like a big idea that will I have to deal with for three years. You know, I just want to keep writing, make money, and have an engaging day for the three hours I finally allow myself to write. If I ever get there. Well, I, I, I can just tell you that it's a lot easier when part of your novel writing practice is reporting. So if he's out reporting on a day, he can then go back to the screenplay the next day. Or he can work on the screenplay. Not so much screenplays. He's really only doing television now. He doesn't do any screenplays. And so the television is really, that's that's nothing compared to writing a screenplay. It's 60 pages. Um, and he usually just does the pilot. And you do that pilot, and then you're ready and refreshed to go back to the novel. But when he wrote The Whites, he, the whole time he was writing that, he did not do any screenplays. He, he, he has to stay in the writing of the novel. He can have the reporting of the novel going on while the screenwriting is going on, but he can't write and do screenplays. Isn't that fair yeah. to say? Yeah. It's like I, I can do prepping for the book mm -hmm. just to make myself feel like I've, I've not abandoned something. But yeah, this is what you said. I just, I need the money. It's a lighter form of writing, and I feel fortunate that I can make my money doing writing as opposed to doing something else. Uh, the, the question, if anybody in here, is what is the most useful elements of screenwriting that uh, would help novel writing and vice versa? Scre uh, screenplays and novels are enemies. I mean, one is about language, one is about prose, one is about length and development of character. The other one is kind of like, got to do everything super fast, you know. It's because, a blueprint. Yeah. It's a blueprint for a visual medium. It's not really writing. So actually what I learned from each to the other is more hurtful than, than helpful because it's two separate instincts. So it's like playing racquetball for two hours and then playing squash or playing softball for two hours and then playing hard baseball. You know, you, it's kind of deceptively similar, but you're going to wind up in the hospital. Uh, the gentleman in the cab, because he's raised no, no, no. his hand, and I we I haven't. I was wondering, you guys are talking about the competitiveness of having the material for your writing. Have you ever considered doing a joint project together and then writing? And what I was thinking was that um, I know that Maureen, you did the uh, on a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting, and you were talking about uh, the underbelly and you know human rights issues with uh, Dallas or in Texas, Texas, police, yeah. The Richard in his novel. You know, I think that is definitely a place you've really hit it, where we intersect. And I tend to be, uh, I come from a place 
first of all, Texas is not New York. Uh, very different mentalities, just, just a, a whole different kind of policing. Um, and I tend to be, uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't like cops very much. Now, the ones I've met through Richard, I've, I've fallen hard for because they're people, they're people to me. Um, but I, I couldn't really write the way Richard writes sympathetically about cops. I couldn't do it. Uh, I don't have it in me to do that. But it doesn't mean that I think he shouldn't write sympathetically. I, I, I've worshipped his writing for as long as I've been alive to read. So, you know, it's not all one way. But I also think that collaborating is not something, it's like saying to Picasso, gee, you and Matisse are such good friends. Why don't you guys paint a painting together? You know, not to make it like we're Picasso and Matisse, like, hey, don't mean that at all. But when I put it that way, you know, no, they're not going to paint a painting together. Mm -mm. Yeah. The gentleman in, with the yeah. glasses back. <laughs> oh, you mean me for him? Jealous? No, no. Why? Oh, uh, well, no. I think I think there is. I think I because we met later in life. Um, I think that I had accomplished many things in my life, and I was. I knew who I was, and I think it's different when you meet in your twenties and you're both trying to make it. I think that is almost. A that, that's, that's untenable. That's, that's a recipe for some very bad stuff. Um, but I think because we, you know, I was 48 and he was 58 when we met. And I had accomplished a lot, and he certainly had. And I think there was so much mutual respect. I think it helped that, that we had read each other's work before meeting each other and liked it. Um, and yes, there is little bits of, you know, uh, like I said, uh, I, I, I want to use something, and I, I'm afraid he's going to use it. But that's so teensy compared to the overall fun we have, just like, because we're so alike in the way we approach things, um, that we have a lot of fun just gabbing about it, you know, and getting a little, little you know, toasted at night and, and talking Sometimes about it. A little, a little more than a little. Um, <laughs> But there's also the other thing is when you meet somebody, like Lorraine said, you know, on the other side of the 50 yard line, <laughs> and you had a lot of life on, and you've you've had a lot of life in your belly. Um, you're not all consumed. I, I mean, early in my life, before I met Lorraine, I just sort of thought writing for me was where I wasn't that happy, and writing for me. And a claim that I could get for writing was very important for making me feel like I'm okay. You know, I'm I I've got something. Um, the older I get, and if you're with somebody you love, all of a sudden the writing it's not like the writing is not important. It's what you do, but sometimes love can make you feel like there's a lot more to life than writing. You know, it's somehow writing nestles into its proper place in Priorityville. You know, it's not screaming in first place anymore. It's, um, it's got a lot of competition from just, you know, f feeling you, you, you're loved and you love someone, you know, uh, as pretty much as unconflictedly as, as you can imagine. And this um, eerie thing of like, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, shit. What do I, how do you be happy? I'm happy. I'm happy. What do you, what do, you do with it? You know, and it could, I've been, so much of my life been conditioned to be like, if not a mope, just feeling like comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
now I'm struggling with, I like waking up in the morning. I like seeing her. <laughs> you know, I like screwing off. I like working sort of semi. And then I like meeting together at night. You guess what? This is life. Writing is not life. Life is life. And, you know, I'm 67. You know, I, I only have another 40 years to go. <laughs> and, you know, it's, I've never been in this place. And maybe that's why a little bit, like, I'm a little, a little more casual about getting to the desk these days because it's not life or death anymore to me. It's not, like, I'm only as good as the praise I get for writing a book. Eh. Yeah, I want it. Yeah, I want a write book. You know, I really want to know I'm writing well. But that's just one thing in my life. You know, it's it's a it's an important thing, but it's not the only thing, thank God. Oh, that's uh, that, he, uh, the question was asking me about a particular scene in Mad Dog and Glory, uh, which is a movie uh, that I wrote with uh, Robert De Niro playing a crime scene photographer, and Uma Thurman and Bill Murray, um, and it was one scene that I, I actually let me play a detective in this scene, and um, <laughs> what happened in that scene was. I can't act my way out of a, a sandwich bag. And um, there's a dead body on the floor in the restaurant. De Niro, as a crime scene detective, is supposed to come and photograph the body. And he's, he's just uh, had sex with Uma Thurman. Not as Uma Thurman, as a character. <laughs> as, um, and he's coming in, and he sees the dead body. And he's, and he's usually a, a poker face mope. But he's feeling great. He's falling in love. You know, he's just got his, you know, never mind. And um, so the scene is he walks in. Um, he sees the body. He goes to the jukebox. He puts on Louis Prima's I Ain't Got No Body. And he starts dancing towards the body, you know, like. And, um, you know, at which point I'm in the foreground and I say to the other cop, who's David Caruso, Something, 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 except what it came out of my mouth was move. <laughs> and I said, All right, let's take that from the top. And so De Niro comes in, does the whole dancing, 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 <laughs> drops to a knee, you know, and uh, and I uh, and I say, <laughs> I said, Well, nine times he had to come in before I got my one freaking line down and sort of like. The line was really complex, like, I think he's dead. You know? <laughs> but this way actors go to acting school. But I think that's the scene you're referring to. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I guess I have a related question. That was so key, but I thought it was a good coincidence. Or just a I don't know. I just write them. But did, did they ever talk to you out of, did they take things out of the script that got you in trouble or something like that? They don't talk me out of it. They do what they want. You know, it's like, you, you got to understand this. It's, you know, I'm screen, screenwriters. Here's screenwriters. Here's the studio, and you know, above the cumulus crowd, cloud. And, um, you know, everybody else is in between on top of you. They don't ask you anything. They, they might ask you to, you know, make another copy. You know, um, <laughs> that's about it. And your publisher's Xerox, you know. Yep, Sonia. Procrastination. Let's look it up the next time we <laughs> produce her. <laughs> you know. uh, I, I think we made it up. I think we coined that I word. I think it's well, kind of like a colloquial. Anyway, um, what I wanted to ask you, I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear you both talk about procrastination because you both chose to work with it. And I'm wondering if either one of you have experienced not a couple of days or weeks of procrastination, but just really being not writing a book and and having you know having having issues about mm. writing. Um, 
I don't think I have. I mean, um, I think I've worked I'm on I'm always you know. writing. It's just, do I like what I wrote? You know, to me, when I write things, and I know they're not good enough for my mm -hmm. standards, that just sends me into, you know, the slaw of despond. I'm just like, I feel like, you know, there's gravel circulating in my arteries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I always feel like you will go in there and you will write. I mean, that's the discipline of it. Whether I like it or not is the agony of it. So I've never really not written. How about you? I don't know if it's. I, I've been in the same situation. It's not like I'm always writing something. Um, but I've been in situations in which I know I've taken a wrong turn. And I keep going in the wrong way because I so desperately do not want that to be the wrong turn. And the wrong turn gets as big as the Bavarian Black Forest. And that could be months of where every day you realize you, you know, you're running on a broken leg. You, now you think, well, the only way to uh, stop running on a broken leg is to run faster. You know, so you keep getting back. And that's, I, I'd rather, rather be doing anything else than writing on those days, except golf. Like you, always, like you always have something that you want to write about. Kind of, sort of, yeah. I mean, I yeah, know. yeah, I do. I, I do. I mean, that's what I do. That's what I've been doing all my life, know. you know. I don't know what else to do. Yes. This should be the last question, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Get back to the short story question. Uh, thank you for being a short story. It, it, it is normal, I think. Uh, but is it more than that? Is that really positive? That's a way of looking at it, you know. That's very healthy. Are you a therapist? No, I think that it's, it's about your attitude about not quite wanting to work that hard. I haven't, you know, maybe I you know, you just need to read and, and orient yourself to your day um, and work your way up. I've never been able to jump out of bed and start writing creatively. I, but I, I, I can. I actually can. She's done that. Yeah. If I'm really in this, what I call the zone, I, before I even have coffee, I go up to my office and I'm like, okay, this, this, this. It's more editing what I did the night before, but it's because I'm so excited about where I am. I want to look at it, make sure it's really as good as I think it was, and you know that kind of thing. But he doesn't do that ever. No, I've seen her suffer, and, you know, go to sleep in the middle of the afternoon on the, on the couch. <laughs> You know, um, but I'm in deep sleep. And then, like right now, it's like she hates eating because it takes away from writing. Yeah, that's know. how I am right now. So, right. anyways. Thank, thank you, you so much for coming. <laughs>